So our next uh, speaker is Marcos Basiljevic. He's from the Department of Biology at UC Riverside. He began in uh, 2016, one of an exciting new coterie of faculty they've got at UCR. Marco is going to be talking about trait-based approaches to understanding and maximizing ecosystem resilience. Okay. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, um, hi. Thank you, Hugh and Nicole, for inviting me. It's really great to be here. I'm a little bit of a weirdo in that I'm sort of new to Chaparral, and I haven't really worked there much. So I'm going to be talking a lot about sort of ideas and paths forward as opposed to previous work. I'll be showing some examples from work across Woody systems that sort of applies. Some similar trait-based ideas, but no real data from Chaparral. So I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hear Carla drinking something. Sorry, go ahead, Marco. No worries. Okay. All right. So um, this is still on. Okay. Uh, so I'm a plant community ecologist, generally interested in patterns of biodiversity and nature. Oh, you can see what happened. Use the, if you want to use the uh, microphone over at the table over there, that looks better. Just grab that one. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Better. All right. Can you hear me better now? All right. I'm a plant community ecologist, generally interested in theoretical questions about plant communities. What drives patterns of biodiversity? And part of this is to understand this so we can apply it to pressing environmental concerns. And so Carla talked about restoration in Chaparral is really hard, right? We have multiple factors interacting that are gonna influence these communities and how we restore them. So what I wanna talk to you about today is instead of restoring them, maybe we can start making them more resilient to some of these things like fire and drought and nitrogen deposition. And so I'm gonna start with a few definitions and so just so we're all on the same page, have the classic definition of resilience here. This is engineering resilience. Um, the ability of a system to recover state or function following a disturbance. This is often presented as these ball and cup models. Many of you are probably are familiar with these, but the idea is that this ball here represents a community state. We have some sort of disturbance come in that pushes the system, but because it's resilient, it's able to recover back to that original state. If the disturbance is bad or if the system isn't terribly resilient, we push it into a new undesirable state, which has its own resilience, which often present, prevents restoration at impacts. All right, so we get into our invaded state here, and it's really hard to get back to that native state. And so why? Why are some of these systems harder to restore? Why do some have more resilient to these changes than other systems? And we know when we look across our systems, we see a lot of variation in resilience. So some of the work we've done in the alpine tundra, we're actually seeing a lot of resilience in those communities. This is a system that's impacted by changing in the length of the growing season, often resulting in longer midsummer droughts, a lot of nitrogen deposition. But we actually see the vegetation here is incredibly resilient. We're seeing very few changes over time. We've been looking at this for over 20 years out in Colorado. Southern California, as you all know, is sort of the opposite, right? This is a system where we're seeing a lot of big changes. Work by Edie Allen, Katie Suiting, Sarah Kimball have shown that nitrogen deposition, fire, it results in sort of these big vegetation changes and these type conversions that we've been hearing about today. So what I wanna to talk to you about today in general is about how we can potentially use these functional traits that Carla's been talking about to maximize the resilience of our chaparral systems and our systems in general. And so there's this idea of resilience is probably the most talked about and least tested idea in ecology. There's tons of theory. So going back in the 70s and up until more recently, people write tons of theoretical papers about this. There's very few actual tests. But the theory suggests that the function of any given species lost to a disturbance can be replaced by other functionally redundant species in high diversity systems. Right? <clears throat> so in theory, more diversity equals more resilience. But we're particularly focusing on two things here. One is functional redundancy, which means things are the same, but also high diversity, things are different. So we really have two components here that we need to focus on. We're thinking about this resilience and how we're gonna maximize it. <clears throat> so how do we get both of these? So as Carla mentioned, functional traits are a way to do this. So instead of just thinking about individual species, you can think about the characteristics of those traits 
and Carla gave a pretty good overview of a lot of those. And here's just a picture you know, of our leaf traits, our seed traits, our penguin traits. Not as useful for chaparral, but they're awfully <laughs> cute to measure. You do have much more intensive things like you know, photosynthetic capacity. As Carla mentioned, these are hard to do in a lot of species. So we often focus on things that are easy to measure across a lot of species. And one, because it makes it really easy to start generalizing across species, understand broad scale patterns. This is GM Rossii. Anybody know this plant? Probably not. It's an alpine plant, has a circumpolar distribution, right? But if you start looking at it, if you're a botanist, you automatically start taking a trait based approach. It has yellow flowers, has highly divided leaves, right? Now, if I tell you it's a short perennial forb, has a low specific leaf area, it's rhizomatous. It's a lot of secondary chemicals and its tissues. You can think about species in your own systems, and those are probably going to respond similar to similar environmental drivers. So because it has low SLA, it's likely more drought tolerant, just like other low SLA species. So we can start to think across differences in systems about how these different species will <clears throat> interact with the environment and respond to these different disturbances. They also provide a lot of insights when experimental approaches are more challenging. So in general, we wanna do our experiments and mechanistically test these ideas, but it's hard in a lot of systems. So going back to our alpine tundra, this little cushion plant here is about the size of a dinner plate. And it's 200 years old, All right? So doing experiments on that, it's gonna take a long time. A lot of our forests, here's a 500 year old old growth forest. Again, we you know, need hundreds of years to do experiments. A lot of our chaparral systems are old, and they're not you know, burnt down. And so it requires a lot of time to see these dynamics play out. And so by taking these trait-based approaches, we can get an idea of these mechanisms that are operating and then pair these with sort of specific experiments that will test specific hypotheses instead of starting from you know, less information. And lastly, they sort of mediate the responses to and effects on the environment. So here's three manzanita species. They all have very similar traits. They're likely gonna be able to have similar responses to the environment, allowing us to better understand how these different species are gonna respond. So how do we take these traits and translate it to resilience? So going back to our definition here, we have functional redundancy that we're interested in and functional diversity. So we can take a trait axis here. You can imagine this is our PC1 from Carla's talk, for example, or seed mass. We can focus on different components of functional diversity that tell us information about the functional composition of those communities and think about which components of this we want to maximize for maximizing resilience. So here we have what we call functional richness. This is the range of functional strategies in a community. So here we have some pretend species, these little circles. So here we have a high functional diversity where we have high functional richness, but we don't have much redundancy in these different strategies. So if you were to lose these here, we would lose this component from the system. Another way to look at it is functional dispersion or functional diversity. And so here we're looking at the abundance of those species and those functional strategies as well. All right. So in this case here, we have a lot more functional redundancy as well as functional diversity. So we have many Greek species with this green trait, many with this purple trait. And so if we lose a few, we still have functional diversity that may, we still have species with these traits that may be able to maintain that function or that state in that community. So the question is, do we need both that width and that height, or can we maximize one versus the other to sort of maximize our resilience in these communities? So can we get away with, do we need all this, or can we just get away with fewer strategies and more diversity within those strategies? So this is a question some colleagues and I set out to test. Uh, this is part of an Ecological Society of America working group a couple years ago. And we went, decided to ask this question about what influences resilience to, of productivity to wildfires. So as I mentioned, this is one of the most theoretically examined questions, but the actual empirical tests on the ground are actually quite rare. So when we did a literature review back in 2016, we found two studies that looked at the resilience of productivity to fire. And this is at small sort of meter square plots, no real large landscape scale tests. And so we wanted to you know, ask this question is, well, how does functional diversity influence resilience? And then can we think about how we can maximize that resilience for making our landscapes more resilient to fires in the future? 
So we're going to scale up this sort of biodiversity resilience relationship. And so because this is a working group and we didn't have any money, we're using all free data. So this is going to be a lot of remote sensing data. <clears throat> and so our disturbance was fire. This is based on USGS land fire data. And so we identified high severity fires in the southwest over a six state region and found all the fires we could, regardless of size, that were classified as high severity. As our metric of resilience, we looked at the recovery of productivity over 10 years. So asked how quickly sort of the greenness of the vegetation came back over 10 years using NDVI. We compared this to an adjacent area that was unburned to look at sort of interannual variation in that change in productivity. <clears throat> we got data from basically vegetation associations in these areas. So, you know, like pinion juniper woodlands, there's a list of species for that. We compiled that list of species, got a species richness for each pixel that we were working in, and then used the Q seed information database to get seed mass on all those species and USDA plants to get what we're referring to as fire traits. So this is fire tolerance, re <clears throat> fire resistance, and resproutability. These are all sort of yes, no, binary traits. <clears throat> and so these are the 133 wildfires we analyzed. And so they're spread out across a wide region of the Southwest United States. And see they vary in size quite a bit. And we focused on wooded systems. Uh, this included 16 different vegetation types, and we were able to get data on 239 species. So there's a few other fires here in the system. You can see some pretty large ones. Of these tend to be either low intensity or mixed intensity, so we wanted to keep things as consistent as possible. <clears throat> and so we analyze these data using a structural equation model. And the way this works is here we have our resilience, the thing we're interested in in the end. And we can ask how diversity or functional diversity influences resilience. This is akin to sort of, sort of a simple linear regression. And then these models will get a path coefficient that gives you the strength of that relationship. As we know, things <clears throat> fire, the responses to fire are influenced by climate, topography, and weather. We didn't have good weather data, so we used bioclim, 10 year average climate variables and topographic variables from a digital elevation model. And we can ask how these factors as well influence resilience. So how does mean annual precipitation or temperature influence resilience as well as the topographic position across the landscape? What's really powerful about these statistical approaches is it allows us to look at both direct and indirect effects. So we know things like temperature, precipitation, topography influence fire and the resilience, but they also influence biodiversity. So we can ask how the elevation influences resilience directly and also how it influences diversity resilience indirectly via its influence on diversity so it allows us to ask a lot of direct effects of drivers on resilience both diversity and these topographic and environmental variables as well as their indirect effects on resilience so i'm going to show you three models one for species richness one for seed mass and one for these fire traits this was our initial model for all of our models. Um, we tried looking at minimum and maximums here, but they weren't terribly predictive, so we didn't include them. In these next slides, any black line that disappears is not significant. It's not a significant predictor of these relationships. Any gray line is marginally significant. And we'll have R square values for these two components here, how much variation we're explaining with this approach. So we look at species richness, and sort of not surprisingly, it's not a very strong predictor of resilience. Simply, the number of species in the system doesn't tell us how resilient that system is to wildfire, right? And this is, you know, sort of not surprising as we're suggesting that these functional traits are likely more important. So here we find a marginally significant relationship, and find that slope is actually the biggest driver of resilience here. Similarly, when we look at the functional diversity of seed mass. Maybe not surprisingly, we find no significant influence of functional diversity of those traits on seed mass for the system. When we look at our fire traits, yes, <clears throat> our resproutability, our reseedability, and our fire tolerance, we do see significant relationships here. And so those last two models weren't terribly significant, but I'll walk you through this one. Here we have resilience, significantly influenced by slope. So steeper slopes are more resilient 
and lower elevations were more resilient. And we find that both functional richness and functional dispersion influence resilience, but in different directions. So here we have a positive coefficient and here we have a negative coefficient. So here we need greater functional diversity, but lower functional richness. So what that means when we come back to this is that we need a few strategies potentially to be more resilient, but we need a wide diversity of species within those strategies. So instead of having the wide and tall system, we need a potentially, we don't need every single one of those strategies to create a resilient system, but a diversity of species within each of those strategies. So if we wanna maximize resilience, there's a potential that we can don't have to focus on every single strategy and every single species. However, as I mentioned, you know, I'm sort of new to the chaparral system. This needs a lot of on the ground tests. This is done with large scale remote sensing data. This is very coarse data. But I think the chaparral system is an outstanding place to actually test a lot of these ideas. We have similar traits. We have complex landscapes. We can start testing some of these ideas on the ground and really get an idea of how much of this functional diversity we really need to make these systems resilient. And so instead of resort, restoring some of these systems, we may be able to add in, say our system is degraded and we just need to add in a little bit of this green bar to make that system more resilient to, trade, to fire or whatever you know, disturbance we're thinking about. And so I think this has a lot of potential, but still there's a lot of work to do. As I mentioned, this is, you know, resilience is one of the most talked about ideas that has very few tests. There's a lot of small scale tests and now our one large scale test, we don't really have anything in, in between. And so I think these trait-based approaches can really help inform both restoration, as Carla mentioned, but as well as resilience. And balancing between those two, we can take these trait-based approaches and maximize our resilience where we can so we don't have to restore in some cases and then still use them to restore in other cases when we haven't been able to maximize that resilience or in response to some things that have already happened. As I mentioned, you know, we still need to link these to on-the-ground surveys. So that's all I have for this. I also wanted to mention one other project we're starting in my lab. So as part of the Smithsonian has a network of forest, it's the Forest Global Earth Observatory, the network of 64 forest dynamics plots around the country. And so what we're doing on the slope of Mount San Jacinto is gonna be stem mapping about 20 hectares of forest. So about 20,000 plus trees will be getting a stem and be monitored for about the next 30 years or until I retire. We'll be putting dendrometer bands on there as well to be getting daily measurements. And here's a close up the area. There's a nice chaparral sort of up in this area, some mixed oak and conifer forest. So if anybody's interested in collaborating, we have some nice, we'll have some really nice data starting in about a month. And with that, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you.